When you drive the brand ranked number one in dependability by J.D. Power, you can stop thinking about what you can't do and start doing what you never thought possible. Visit your local Kia dealer today to see yourself behind the wheel of the brand ranked number one in dependability by J.D. Power. Kia, movement that inspires. Call 800-333-4KIA for details. Always drive safely. Kia received the fewest reported problems among all brands in the J.D. Power 2022 U.S. Vehicle Dependability Study based on 2019 models. See jdpower.com slash awards for 2022 details. Hurry into Ram Power Days and experience the raw power of the Ram 3500 with available best-in-class torque and towing among 350-3500 pickups when properly equipped. Strap yourself in for one powerful ride in the Ram TRX with the most horsepower of any gas pickup ever built. Or the Ram 1500, awarded number one in driver appeal among light-duty pickups by J.D. Power three years in a row. Hurry into Ram Power Days going on now. For J.D. Power 2022 U.S. award information, visit jdpower.com awards. Revived Thoughts is a production of Revive Studios. This is Troy and Joel, and you are listening to Revive Thoughts. If our heart condemns us, God is greater. And by these words, he shows that not a single Christian should believe his own heart, but that instead he must believe God's gracious promises. Every episode, we bring you a different voice from history in a sermon that they delivered today. We're hearing a sermon by Lars Levi Lestadius. It was preached after an Easter service to condemn self-righteousness in its congregation. Troy, how are you doing today? How was your How was your Thanksgiving? Thanksgiving was good. We didn't have a turkey because turkeys here were um, well over $100 to purchase. Uh, didn't go for <laughs> that. So we had a little little baby chicken, and uh, but we did have green bean casserole, and we did have sweet potato casserole, and it was great. My wife did an amazing job. Uh, we had a huge event at our school that day to serve uh, students who had like special needs, and it was a really nice. cool time. Um, we had 140 families from the community come, so it was awesome for them. And then we went and drove two hours on motorcycles uh, the next day, next early in the morning, and traveled far away. And then we on came motorcycles? back today. Yeah, we did the whole trip on motorcycles. Very bumpy. With the children? Uh, with the children. Yeah. So I have one, and Elise has one, and we took them out. Uh, for those who maybe a... are newer to the program, sure. I live in Indonesia. So that's part of what we're talking about here. So do you uh, put we don't the have child car. in front of you? Like, in between my son arms? sits in between my legs in front of me, and then Mira yeah. is old enough that she can hold on on the back. So she holds oh, on okay. on the back, and then um, and she does great, and we they do very well. And uh, it was really good going to the city, going to vacation with the motorcycle saved us money. We didn't have to pay for a driver to get out there and back. It was really, really pretty views of the volcano nearby. Getting back was bad. We went a different route to avoid some thunderstorms, and it, we did end up getting rained on, and mm. it was a bumpy potholed. I uh, tripped through a mountain and I almost fell on multiple <laughs> occasions and I it was and it was a nightmare. Um, so we won't go that road again. But uh, it was the, the vacation itself was very nice. Um, but the the ride out there and the, the sorry the ride out there was beautiful, but the ride back was a nightmare. We almost got hit by yeah. cars. We almost got run over by dump trucks. I mean, it was yeah. just everything you could possibly pretty much have go wrong on a motorcycle except for a flat tire occurred on that trip. Yeah, that sounds terrifying. Well, anyway, <laughs> so how was your Thanksgiving show? Was it better than that, I'm sure? Yeah, oh, yeah. No, I was great. Very chill. Traditional family get together, right? All, everyone gets together. This year, I, some of my relatives, I don't know, they got a line on uh, like barbecue burnt ends, like for food. And so, which is we a Kansas had, City classic barbecue sure. item if you've never been yeah, there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, we, it, and you know, I'm not that big fan of turkey anyway. So, we had a lot of barbecue. And, you know, I, I'm all for championing that as my new Thanksgiving tradition. Uh, it's way, it's way, a barbecue Thanksgiving is way better than turkey Thanksgiving. I know it's controversial, but I'm going to, I'm going to say it. It's, I'd be happy if it was just that way every Thanksgiving. There you go. There it is. All right, Joel, let's jump into this. Uh, but before we do Twitter shout out, normally we read Apple podcast reviews, but this was such a nice, uh, shout out on Twitter that we just had. And if you shout us out on Twitter, I cannot promise I'll read it on the episode, but you know what? I'm going to try to add more of these in here because uh, we actually get a lot of those on there, and I would kind of want to kind of give the give the give the love to the people who are throwing us love out there on Twitter. So this is from Stuart, who said, "This is epic. I just noticed my playlist is full of Revive Thoughts episodes. Check it out. Honestly, you will be blessed. Your eyes and heart will be opened to why we need church history. Sit back, chill, listen, and 
grow. I feel like that. I mean, you can't really get a better um, encouragement to check out our show yeah. than that. So thank you so much, Stuart. That was really kind of you. And if you throw us a shout out on Twitter or you give us an Apple podcast review, we're going to be trying to add this kind of mixture in here um, of, of different ways you can reach us. All right, Lars. Levi Lestadius, uh, probably not a name many of us are familiar with. I'll I'll throw it out there. I did not know who this guy was before this episode. Mm-hmm. No, yeah, me neither. Lestadius, Lestadius. It is a cool name. I do like the name. Not familiar with it, though. He was born in the year 1800 in Sweden. So we're up in that kind of like uh, Scandinavian, Finland, Sweden, Norway area up north. He's a descendant of a group of people called the Sami, which lived in the northern parts of Sweden, Finland, and Norway. They were a nomadic tribe that hunted and fished and lived off the land. And to this day, they're still the only people that are legally allowed to hunt and herd reindeer in Norway. Fun fact. The Sami were slowly moved off of their land and kind of relegated to the outskirts society in the 17th century. However, uh, Swedish missionaries started reaching out to them during this time, and many of them became Lutherans in the 18th century. The Lutheran church was the only one in Sweden that was legally allowed by decree of the king at the time. Lestadius' father struggled a lot during this time. He had a job as a fisherman and later as a hunter and then as a tar maker and then even a silver mine worker. And while his silver mine worker job uh, did well for him, paid well for him, he lost that job due to a problem that was kind of uh, more widespread in the Sami community. That is the problem of alcohol. Over time, the alcoholism of his father and his long absences from the family uh, led to Lestadius basically being raised by his half-brother, who was a pastor who lived in a nearby town. Uh, this man allowed Lestadius and his younger brother to get a good education, um, especially from children kind of of their background and lifestyle, their dad not being in the picture. It wasn't usually opportunities for them to get a good education, weren't many. Uh, they even got accepted into a university. This looked like a great chance for them. But just as they were getting ready to go to university, their half-brother uh, the pastor died. He was their main means of support while they would be there. Yet Lestadius and the, his brother still went. They, he, was, he was an excellent student. Uh, he had gone to school to pursue theology, but on the side, he did botany, and he was so good at it that they hired him as an assistant botanist to the professors there. They told him he should really be pursuing a career in botany. That's what he's a prodigy at it. Uh, but he felt called to be a pastor and so was ordained as a Lutheran priest in the Church of Sweden. Now, a life for Lestadius would have continued in this direction if it hadn't been for an encounter that he had while he was going around at the age of 44. So he's he's an older, you know, he's, he's I don't want to say older, uh, midlife. He's midlife by this point, right? He met a, a Sami woman, and she would end up changing his life. This woman was a part of a group in Sweden called Pietists, and they had recently formed as a group. They were descendants of another group called Moravians. And she explained that there was more to faith than just walking around and having all the right answers. She said that faith needed to be lived out and that the answers to, to all of how one would live out faith are found in the Bible. Lestadius talks about these conversations that he had with this woman and how it was really through her that that God showed this path to eternal life that he had not understood up to that moment. It was something that uh, yeah, was revealed to him through these conversations. And from that moment on, his, his ministry changed. He began basing his sermons on the Bible. You know, it changes your worldview. And it resonated with people. People, you were also hungering for those answers, also hungering for what the Bible genuinely had to say there. People describe his sermons as having a, quote, new kind of color, end quote. And the word began to spread across Sweden. Lestadius' new kind of style and teaching would become pretty popular in the area. I like that quote about new kind of color. It just reminded me of like, almost like, you know, TV went from black and white to having color. Mm. I just kind of went in my mind. I was like, I know they didn't have that example to look at. They didn't have uh, black and white photos, you know, TV to color. But that's kind of the vibe it gave me. All right. I, well, yeah, when I think of... When I think of like, uh, yeah, Lutheranism in this era in the 1800s, yeah, it is it is kind of making that shift over, and I could definitely see, yeah, people just being a little bit lost as far as what, what, what are we doing here? Like, what's what is what is all based on, and and having a lot of questions there, uh, and so I it, it totally makes sense to me that having someone explain. Yeah, a Christ worldview through the Bible would be an eye-opening experience for them. 
We we should really put. I mean, I said this. I think on our last episode, we should do a revived conversation topic. But we should really do a revived conversation topic on like, <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know the name of it. Would be like the Great Cooling Off or something. But mm. if you have the 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 Great Awakening happening in America, and you have the Reformation in the 1500s, there's a there's a like an era of 1800s where Europe went from like really on fire mm. and interested in religion and God to just like just kind of they had the right answers, but they weren't living it out in a lot of the parts of Europe and. This is another example of like a response to that. Um, it would definitely pin a topic idea for that because I think, I think it's important to see that if it's not rejuvenated, you know, it's like Spurgeon said, the mm-hmm. downgrade controversy isn't. There's not something breathing life into it again, like Lestadius. Uh, it kind of dies. But anyway, his movement, this movement by Lestadius became known as Lestadianism, which that's the name, and uh, it's still around to this day. They place an emphasis on forgiveness and justification by Christ. Uh, that one thing that's unique about them is they put a really huge emphasis on what they call the quote true Christians uh, versus those who they perceive as not being alive in Christ. And this is probably due a lot to the fact that their founder, Lestadius, was a Lutheran minister for like 20 years before he became a Christian. And so he saw this as a real problem in his time. And it's something that they still are very concerned about people who walk around with all the answers, but they're not living their faith out in any kind of real way. It reminds me of something that John Wesley um, and George Whitfield and they struggled with too, where they were reading their Bibles, they were praying all the time, but they didn't actually had not acknowledged, had not really had a relationship with the God of the Bible, the Christ that they served. Now they were also big on being against alcohol. He saw it as one of the many ways the religious were just ceasing to be religious was they were chasing the bottle. Um, he was kind of a teetotaler before the prohibition was really kind of going. I don't, I couldn't, didn't have time to see if Lestadius' writings made it out there, and that's maybe part of the reason where the prohibition comes from. Um, but he is kind of early on that movement of seeing a problem. But then again, he looked around his own people and saw what alcohol was doing and was like, this is really causing a lot of problems. Here's a quote that I found that just kind of, I think, exemplified the change that was taking place from the people and what they were seeing. The Sami began to notice that Lestadius had changed. His sermons were filled with vivid metaphors from the lives of the Sami that they could understand. He preached about a God who cared about the lives of the people. He attacked the priests and traders who were lining their pockets at the expense of others. And after 20 years, something new had begun to happen between the pastor and his congregation. Young and old alike wanted to learn to read. They were also, they were a bustle of energy and excitement in the church with people confessing their sins, crying and praying for forgiveness. Not everybody liked it, of course. Those who had previously earned a lot of money through the sale of liquor saw their incomes disappear and derided this new morality. Drunkenness and the theft of reindeer diminished, which had a positive influence on the Sami's relationships, on their finances, and on their family life. And I think as a as a witness of Christ movie, that it's hard to get a better testimony than uh, mm-hmm. the sellers of alcohol are complaining, the people are too upright, and the and the and the criminals are going away. That the police have less work to do. And there just seems to be a lot of energy in the church. It doesn't mean that something good is happening, but that's a pretty good witness of what you're doing. Lutherans began to hold separate services for the stadiums because they were just so different than the rest of the Lutherans. This is part of a movement that kind of, as we mentioned, was sweeping through Europe as a response to kind of the coldness at the time. A little bit of heart and soul was being breathed in the life of different parts of Europe. The stadianism also spread through the Sami very effectively because to them, they saw it as a people, as a Christian movement, not from the outside, not forced on them by Swedish people, but coming from within, from their own people. And it really resonated with them because of that. Can I just, I just wanted to point out, there's, when you were reading the quote, you said drunkenness and theft theft of reindeer diminished, which I think is a pretty funny quote. Like there's just drunk people trying to steal reindeer. Like, I mean, I'm probably, it probably did happen. Yeah, I bet it happened. That's a I, that is a funny line. Drunkenness and like, because that's like the type of wording that'd be in a police report. You know, like it's a, true. Like a crime that sounds report. like something that comes out of like you know a Canadian police report. Yeah. Is he was drunk and he was stealing Santa's reindeers. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it sounds like. Well, this whole people group that saw me, they rem- I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Frozen, but they remind me of the like the ice people from Frozen, where they just mm. hang out with reindeers and move ice around. That's what that that's in my head what I picture hey. them as. So the Swedish government. They tried to stop this. They were not thrilled with Lestadianism, and they uh, passed laws. They they outlawed it. So some of the parameters that were put in place was that there were no religious gatherings that could occur unless a Lutheran priest was there to uh, authenticate it. You could only go to Sunday Mass or have a family devotion. No other gatherings, no other Bible studies or, or uh, other church services. These laws uh, were there for a while, but in 1860... 
Lestadianism grew outside of Sweden and moved to Finland and Norway and parts of Russia and even North America. And it became, you know, too difficult to control. And it seems like their attempts to regulate it kind of fell by the wayside during that time. Lestadius himself was an incredible person outside of, I mean, and this that alone would make him incredible, of course. But he did some really interesting things. Sweden acknowledged his botany. I remember he was really good with plants. And they actually thought he was so good, they sent him on a paid official botanist mission by the Royal Academy to study plants in different regions of Sweden. He was recognized by Edinburgh and other universities as just like, wow, this guy is really good at botany. Now, I don't know much about plants. I don't know what makes you uh, consider the really good one at botany, but they really did. And because he was so famous as a botanist and as a good Christian man that a French explorer invited him on a special expedition set up to explore and research islands of the northernmost part of Scandinavia. This exploration was actually a really big deal. The captain of the ship went not as French colonizers taking islands, uh, but in cooperation with Norway and Sweden purely to explore and do research. It was one of the first of its kinds. They brought an artist who was really famous to paint the islands and paint what he saw. They brought several different famous researchers to explore. It won awards not only for just the work they did. They did some really good scientific achievements. But it was also one of the first international expeditions where people were going not to conquer a land, but actually just genuinely to research, explore, learn about it without um, taking it afterwards. Lestadius continued to make a name for himself because he was not only this great botanist that went on the trip, but he also helped negotiate them through the land and help them talk to the different people groups there because he was Sami, he kind of spoke some of their languages, and he was even able to meet and preach with people there while he was kind of going through. This exploration and cooperation would eventually kind of help pave the way for the eventual Arctic explorations and Antarctic explorations as different countries were kind of able to team up on these things. So you wouldn't have gotten the North Pole decades later discovered had it not been for this expedition probably going so well. Maybe you would have, but I think it would have been harder if this had, you know, just fallen apart or, you know, gone to mutiny or something like that. For this work, he, Lestadius, earned a Medal of Honor in the French Legion and he was the first ever Scandinav- Scandinavian to do this. It's, it's, he's, he's got a pretty crazy life. You could definitely make a movie out of all that. You know, not everyone is a North Pole uh, converted minister slash master botanist. Like, there's a lot of slash a, revivalist that goes yeah, on to this day. Going yeah. on expeditions and everything. That's You're that's not one of those, Joel? That, that's not everybody? No, no sure am not. <laughs> When you drive the brand ranked number one in dependability by J.D. Power, you can stop thinking about what you can't do and start doing what you never thought possible. Visit your local Kia dealer today to see yourself behind the wheel of the brand ranked number one in dependability by J.D. Power. Kia, movement that inspires. Call 800-333-4KIA for details. Always drive safely. Kia received the fewest reported problems among all brands in the J.D. Power 2022 U.S. Vehicle Dependability Study based on 2019 models. See JDPower.com slash awards for 2022 details. The Venture X Card from Capital One gives you more of what you love, like premium travel benefits and access to Taylor Swift tickets. Ooh, I do love her. Earn five times miles on flights and 10 times miles on hotels through Capital One Travel. Enjoy your stay in Suite 13. Whoa, 13? That's Taylor's lucky number. Plus, get access to Taylor Swift The Eras Tour, presented by Capital One. Maybe I'll see you there. The Venture X Card from Capital One. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com for details. It's Macy's Friends and Family Sale. With an extra 30% off the gifts you'll love to give. And get 15% off beauty with your coupon or Macy's card. That's on top of big savings, like 25% off dressed up designer looks for kids from Calvin Klein and more. Plus an extra 25% off luggage from Samsonite, Delsey and more. Download the free Macy's app for more great deals at Macy's. Winter season is here, and Discount Tire wants you to stay safe on the road. Get 30% shorter average wait time when you buy and book online at DiscountTire.com. Discount Tire, let's get you taken care of. Let's get you taken care of. Science proves quality sleep is vital to your mental, emotional, and physical health. The Sleep Number 360 Smart Bed senses your movements and automatically adjusts to help keep you both effortlessly comfortable. And it's temperature balancing, so you stay cool. So you're at your best for yourself and those you care about most. Life-changing sleep, only from Sleep Number. 
It's time for our Cyber Week special. Save $1,000 on select Sleep Number 360 smart beds and adjustable bases. Plus special financing. Ends Monday. Special financing subject to credit approval. Minimum monthly payments required. See store for details. While doing all of this, he is writing down and collecting all the mythologies of the Sami people. Uh, again, the Sami people now largely have converted over to Christianity. They have all this history, though, and so uh, he archived what the history of the Sami people were, what their beliefs were before Christianity, which is interesting to think about because those would have died out and been completely forgotten. But now we have this archive and this record of what those historical viewpoints were before they became Christians. And it was used by academics all over the world to understand you know, what they believed uh, and you know, their history before they became Christians. Lestadius's life was not an easy one when you look at it as a whole. You know, as a teen, he lost his mother. A few years later, he lost his alcoholic father. His half-brother, as we mentioned, would also pass away. And then early in his 40s, his younger brother who he had gone to school with, also passed away. He also outlived two of his sons, which is also another part of his tragic life. Despite all of his hardships and the incredible tough background that he had, God used him to preach the Bible and justification by Christ alone that changed the entire history of the Swedish people and his own ethnic people group, the Sami people. And here we know that we are of the truth, and will assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, then we have confidence towards God. 1 John 3, 19-21 Here the Apostle John describes a Christian's trials, which are quite extraordinary. For matters of the heart are obscured to many. First, he says, if our heart condemns us, God is greater. And by these words, he reveals that a Christian's heart may at times condemn him. When a vigilant Christian has dreadful temptations, which the devil affects in his flesh, the devil shoots fiery darts from the flesh into the heart. Evil thoughts occur in the mind, and wicked lusts and desires are felt in the will. And finally, self-righteousness arises as a stern and just accuser of the children of God, condemning them in this way. How can you be a Christian with such sin? A Christian should be holy and sinless, but you are like the devil himself. When a self-righteous preaches this, it appears to a Christian that his heart is condemning him. But the heart itself cannot condemn, but it is the devil of self-righteousness who condemns the children of God. And this cunning devil, who comes under the disguise of truth, transforms himself into the angel of light, 2 Corinthians 11, 14. And so many of the pure in heart are deceived because they cannot understand that the one condemning the pure is the devil. However, now Apostle John says, if our heart condemns us, God is greater. And by these words, he shows that not a single Christian should believe his own heart but that instead he must believe God's gracious promises, which show that Christ has come to save not the righteous, but sinners. Matthew 9, 13. As a sinner, the Christian must always flee with all of his sins to the great cross-bearer and believe that he is saved by grace and not by merit. If a Christian were to be judged by his merit, he would be entirely lost. But he is saved by grace if he believes firmly in the one who is greater than even self-righteousness, which preaches condemnation through the heart. This is why Luther also says that he fears his own heart more than the Sultan of Turkey. For every Christian whose conscience is awake feels indeed that his heart is evil, despicable, and filthy. That is the carnal heart which is in the old man, which Paul calls the outward man, but the soul or the spiritual heart, which Paul calls the inward man, is cleansed by Christ's blood. Everything depends on how well the Christian distinguishes between them so that Satan would not succeed in confusing the effects of the outward man and the inward man or the old man 
and the new man in his conscience. May that the great searcher of hearts grant us the light of his Holy Spirit so that we could explain this matter. Hear us, O Father, who is in heaven. Paul says, I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, waging against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity of the law of sin, which is in my members. Romans 7, 22 through 23. Here ye must be a sinner because of the flesh, but holy in spirit. Reason cannot grasp how the sinner can be holy, how the filthy can be pure, and how the perverse can be just. But since we believe that sins are forgiven, we must also believe that the sinner is holy, the filthy is pure, and the unjust is actually just. In his flesh, a Christian is indeed sinful, filthy, and perverse, and like the devil himself. But by grace, he is holy and righteous. Although the devil of self-righteousness preaches to the intellect, you are not holy and righteous, but sinful, perverse, filthy, and wicked and despicable. Now when self-righteousness comes accusing and condemning, and judgment is pronounced by the intellect, although it appears that this condemnation rages in the conscience and heart as if it were come from the heart. John says that if our heart condemns us, God is greater than self-righteousness. And if self-righteousness condemns, God frees us from that condemnation. God has forgiven the sins of the pure. It is more difficult, however, to understand what John means when he says, if our heart does not condemn us, then we have confidence towards God. This statement is true in itself as long as we understand it correctly. But grace thieves can gain a defense for themselves through a false understanding of it. That is, when a grace thief's heart never condemns him, he may think he has confidence towards God. But his confidence is a false reliance on God's grace. Self-righteousness will by no means accuse him as it does pure and believing souls. For if self-righteousness were to start accusing the grace thief that he is wicked and filthy, he would indeed become so afraid that he would have to fall in despair and go to hell. Since, however, his heart doesn't condemn him, the grace thief is confident that God doesn't condemn him either. Therefore, he often says, God won't condemn me for this or that sin. How does the grace thief know what his mortal and ruling sins are? How could a blind man know them? The grace thief has such a poor memory that in the evening he no longer recalls the sins that he has committed during the day. The grace thief doesn't even recall willful sins, let alone sinful thoughts. John's testimony is appropriate for Christians, however, because their heart does not always condemn them, for they have peace with God and a pure conscience. Now they indeed have confidence towards God, and this is how we have understood John's testimony of how the heart condemns, namely, that the one who condemns penitent ones and believers is the devil of self-righteousness. For he is that stern accuser of children of God who accuses them day and night. But God is greater than self-righteousness. The apostle also testifies that we have an advocate with the Father. 1 John 2.1 when that cunning accuser starts accusing the children of God day and night, they have to flee to that great advocate who has resumed responsibility for the affairs of all penitent. Those sorrowing and oppressed souls, he has promised to answer on their behalf in that great court. The accused of the children of God is indeed dreadful in demanding justice from the Christians. He says to the judge, these hypocrites who consider themselves Christians are lusty and thieves. They are murderers. How can your honor protect such persons? But then the advocate of the penitent sinners steps before the judge, who is the true father of believing and penitent souls, and says, I have already paid the fine for these wretches. I have given my life for them. I have sweat blood for them. I have paid the full price of redemption for them. What more do you demand on behalf of them, you toll hound of hell? And the advocate exposes his chest and shows his wounds to the father and says, Look, dear father, 
I have received these wounds on account of my love for these wretches, and that accused of the children of God is the one who has inflicted them on me. Then the heart of the father is moved, and he tells the advocate, You are my son. This day I have begotten you. I will give you the heathen for your inheritance. You will rule over them with a rod of iron. Psalm 2, 7-9. And then he will tell the accuser, you get behind me, Satan, Matthew 16, 23. You have provoked me to oppress Job without cause, Job 2, 3. You have tormented the innocent Son of God and caused his death. He has now redeemed the prisoners of death who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death until the day spring from on high begins to give light to this dark world. On behalf of these, Jesus the great advocate of penitent ones and believers has paid the perfect ransom. Satan has no authority to condemn those who believe that Jesus fulfilled the law on their behalf when hanging from iron nails on the day of victory. He cried out, now all is finished. So be of good cheer, highly ransomed souls, for the accuser of the children of God had been cast out of heaven onto the earth. He no longer has any authority in heaven. He has no authority over those who have taken the great cross-bearer and the thorn-crowned king as their advocate before the Father. The great Michael has prevailed. And John heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives even to death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, that you have dwelled in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has but a short time. Revelation 12, 10 through 12. Rejoice, therefore, and be exceedingly glad, highly ransomed souls, for your reward is great in heaven. Rejoice, elected souls, for your accuser has been cast out of heaven. He no longer has authority to accuse you, for you have an advocate with the Father who intercedes on your behalf. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, children of God, and cry out with a loud voice that you have prevailed by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of his testimony. If you struggle in your most precious faith until death, soon you too can sing a hymn of victory with the angels and all the redeemed souls. Soon you can sing a new song on Mount Zion and say, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Amen. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Revived Thoughts. Today's sermon was narrated by Nathan Pabarkas. And I apologize, Nathan, if I mispronounced your last name there. He is a youth minister from Kabul Christian Church in southern Missouri. He graduated with a master's in church history from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Nathan enjoys spending time with his wife and three kids, playing disc golf, and talking church history. Most importantly, he loves Jesus. Thank you so much, Nathan, for narrating today's sermon. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it, we do ask you, you you should share it. Tell other people about it. I bet you there is someone in your life who's never heard of Lars Levi Lestadius, and you could tell them, hey, you don't know about the Triple L Wonder? Why don't you check out this episode of Revive Thoughts, and you can learn all about this amazing um, individual. Um, you can also check out our other show, Martyrs and Missionaries, run by the host, Elise, who is telling these amazing, incredible stories of other people you maybe haven't heard of. This episode reminded me just a little bit of her episode that was out recently, The History of Christianity in Greenland, where she goes through another very cold place and how Christianity got there. If you're not looking for that, though, you can check out Lillian Trasher, Peter Parker, and so many other wonderful episodes of amazing individuals, Christian ministers, missionaries, and martyrs who did just wonderful things for the gospel. So we encourage you to go subscribe, check it out, and listen, and have a good time. And again, share, let other people know. 
This is Troy and Joel, and this is Revive Thoughts. Hey there, BreezeLine has a holiday gift just for you. One month of free internet for all your family's gift sites, book flights, and movie nights. Get reliable, fast internet with speeds starting at 100 megabits per second for just $19.99 a month. Plus, free Wi-Fi your way home for the first 12 months. And your first month is free. BreezeLine wishes you all a happy and bright holiday season. If only they could give you a little holiday relief from all the matching family outfits. Service subject to availability. New residential customers in select areas only. Visit BreezeLine.com for complete offer details. When you drive the brand ranked number one in dependability by J.D. Power, you can stop thinking about what you can't do and start doing what you never thought possible. Visit your local Kia dealer today to see yourself behind the wheel of the brand ranked number one in dependability by J.D. Power. Kia, movement that inspires. Call 800-333-4KIA for details. Always drive safely. Kia received the fewest reported problems among all brands in the J.D. Power 2022 U.S. Vehicle Dependability Study based on 2019 models. See JDPower.com slash awards for 2022 details.